All right, so uh, let's work together through these these problems here, um, and we're gonna start. We're gonna go in order because I really want you to think about something that uh, I believe a lot of students have not thought about before, um, very hard. So um, this is a function here. You input things for x, you get things out for y. You know that. Um, so when it says to determine the x-intercepts of the graph, you might say, I don't know how to do that, right? I, you didn't show me how to do that. Um, but it's certainly something that you have been shown, and uh, just a slightly different problem, very slightly. Okay, so let's start by looking at this graph and asking ourselves, what does it mean? What do you mean by y-intercept? Okay, well, the y-intercept, that would be where a graph intercepts the x-axis, and I do it a few times. Right, so this would be an x-intercept, this one, this one, this one. Okay, and you might say, well, I don't know what the x-intercepts are. How could I find them if I don't know where they are, you know? But um, wherever they are, they're on the x-axis. And something I know about the x-axis is that they all are x comma zero, the y value of an x-intercept, a point, an x-intercept is a point, the y value is zero. I know that absolutely for sure. So what this means is whatever I put in for x, the output should be 0. So I set this equal to 0. And you might be tempted to multiply this thing out, but I'll show you how it's so much easier when it looks like this. Um, well, I've got, let's view it as three things. One, two, three things multiplied together. And we're supposed to get 0 as the output. Now that means that either, like, I'm multiplying three numbers together and getting 0, you know, zero, which means that one of these things has to be zero. One of these three things has to be zero. X has to be zero, or X minus two has to be zero. Whoops, X minus two. X minus two has to be zero, or X plus one has to be zero. Which means that either, well, X is zero, or if I subtract two on both sides in this equation, X equals two, or if I or add to, excuse me. If I subtract one on both sides here, I get x is a negative one. And you can see why, because for, for instance, two. Uh, two times two minus two times two plus one. Well, two minus two, that makes zero here. Two times zero times three is zero, right? So you can see that it is so much easier to figure out uh, which x's make the output zero when it's written like this. And this would be called factor form. Um, all right, so we could throw that on our graph. We could say at 0, 2, and negative 1, we have x-intercepts. 0, 2, and negative 1. Those are our x-intercepts. Now we're asked, what x, uh, let's see, you probably didn't see me put those there. There they are. Uh, 0, 2, and negative 1. Uh, so now it says, now that you have the x-intercepts, without using a calculator, determine all x values such that f of x is greater than 0. Keep in mind, f of x is the same as y. It just means the output. What is the, the output is greater than 0. Those numbers are, are positive numbers. That's what we call positive numbers. So this function we want to have come out as a positive output. Let's start with one that uh, the people doing the classwork noticed really quickly, and that would be any x that's bigger than 2. That's pretty clear. Like, if I put anything bigger than 2 in here, then something that's bigger than 2, right, like 3 or, you know, 2.1, 2.01, anything I plug in for x that's bigger than 2, when I subtract 2 from it, it will still be positive. And then if I plug that 3 here and this 3 here, like any x that I plug in, that's bigger than 2 is going to be positive here because it's going to be bigger than 2. It's going to be positive plus 1 is positive. Uh, any number that's bigger than 2 minus 2 is going to be positive. Any number that's bigger than 2 is going to be positive. So it's three positives multiplied together. So there are some numbers, uh, some x values, that will always give me a positive. From, from 2.0001 up to infinity, uh, all of those values of x are going to give me a positive. Okay, well that's when I multiply a positive times a positive times a positive. What about, is there another way to get a, a positive number? Uh, how about a negative times a negative? That gives me a positive. And so I'd have to multiply that by another positive to get positive. So two of these numbers need to be negative, and just one of them needs to be positive in order to get uh, a positive number. Um, and, and certainly you can just start plugging numbers in and see which numbers give me positives, or you can make a 
observation about the graph, but, but uh, I'm just trying to walk you through um, just a different thought process, just a way of thinking. Um, the more ways of thinking you have, the better. Uh, getting stuck in, in one approach, one mindset, and then just trying to use that and apply that to everything is not the best. Um, so let's look at a way that we could make two of these negative and one of them positive. Okay, so let's drop down below two and see what happens. Well, any number that's below two, but still positive, like you know, one, one and a half, one half, three fourths, all those guys. If I plug that number in here, like one, one minus two will be negative. But any number between zero and two that I plug in here is going to, st to still be positive here, right? So I don't know, try one half, or right, one, one is a good, uh, one times one minus two times one plus one. The only negative number comes out here. One minus two will be negative. 0.5 minus two will be negative, but 0.5 put into these, still positive. 0.75, still negative here, still positive there. Uh, 1.999999 uh, minus two, will be still negative, but 1.999, 1.999 plus one, still two positive numbers. So anything that is between, anything that's between zero and uh, two, actually we've noticed that it gives us only a negative here and two positives, it actually gives us a negative. So we can actually use that uh, to our advantage. Let me just uh, lock this in place so I can highlight this and say these are values of x that actually give me negative outputs. Let me put that down there. I just made that observation. Okay, now let's try, well, uh, what if I put a, a negative number in for x? Uh, like negative 0. 0.5, negative 0. 0.5. f of negative 0. 0.5. I guess I should have put f of 1 up here. Negative 0. 0.5. It's negative 0. 0.5 times negative 0. 0.5 plus 2, sorry, minus 2. So that's negative, that's negative. But even though I have a negative 0.5, I'm adding one to it, and so this will come out to be positive. So I'll have a negative times a negative times a positive. You can kind of use your intuition and say, well, that will keep on happening. I'll keep getting a negative and a negative, right? Because negative minus another number is gonna be negative. And a third number is positive as long as it doesn't go past negative one, right? As long as it just gets it as close as it can to negative one. So now we've got x's that are sandwiched between 0 um, and negative 1. Somewhere in between there, those x values will give me a positive output as well. If you're watching this and you're thinking, uh, what do I care? Why, why are you making me do all this? Why are you making me think this way? Um, I understand. But um, you'll be a better, stronger math student for it. So. Um, Take that for what it's worth. You can believe me or not, uh, but yeah, you really should believe me because I, I have done math for a long time. I have hated math, and then I've come to love math. Um, I hated math from eighth grade up through high school. I just really didn't like it. Um, and then when I realized that I was having a, a sour attitude towards it, I, I changed my, my opinions. Um, so let's see. Let's figure out what gives us a negative number. Well, we already figured out that any number between zero and two, what it's gonna do, again, to remind you, uh, what it's gonna do, a number less than two but positive, when I subtract two from it, is going to be negative, right? But then it's gonna be a positive number and a positive number, and so I get an output of a negative, right? Anything between zero and two is gonna give me a negative here, a positive here, and a positive here. Okay, but let's drop down into the negatives and see if we can't get three negative numbers. If we can get three negative numbers multiplied by each other, then that comes out negative. Positive there, negative there. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see if we can figure that out. Uh, well, well, the natural thing is to, to look and see. We've got x's that are bigger than 2, that are between 0 and 2, that are between negative 1 and 0, right? That covers all these x values, just to show you the graph of it. There's 0, there's negative 1. We've talked about all these numbers, right? Uh, uh, negative 1 gives us an x-intercept. 0 gives us an x-intercept. 2 gives us an x-intercept. Um, so naturally, we would want to look at maybe the numbers that are less than negative 1. Less than negative 1, like, um, let's try negative 2. Negative 2, and I think you'll see what's going on here. Negative 2 uh, times negative 2 minus 2 
times negative 2 plus 1, okay? Uh, see, a number that's negative is going to cause both of these numbers to be negative. We've noticed that already. But once we get beyond, this number right here gets beyond negative 1, anything further to the left than negative 1, um, it will make this number negative as well. So we get a negative, we get a negative minus a, ne minus a number is a negative, and negative plus 1, or something that's um, further to the left than negative 1, plus 1 is going to also be negative. So we get three negatives together, and that multiplies to a positive. So any x that's less than negative 1, uh, that is going to produce a negative output. So here we go, these guys right here. So let's talk about what that means. If I plug a number that's bigger than 2 into the function, uh, I am going to, into this function, let's just write it here, f of x equals x times x minus 2 times x plus 1. Um, if I plug a number that's bigger than 2 into this function, I will get out numbers that are positive. Okay. So like if I were to look at a table of it, I put in uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Anything in between and anything that's bigger than 2, like 2.0001, anything bigger than 2, uh, for all of these, we get positive outputs. Okay. So what I know is that when I put in 2, I get out 0. When I put, out anything, put in anything bigger than 2, I'm going to get out positive numbers. If I plug in uh, 3, I'm going to get a positive. One of these numbers up here, right, a positive output. If I put in 4, I'm going to get some positive number. So can see how the graph is going to just kind of go up like this and curve up like we've seen polynomials do. Um, now you might say, well, I don't know what point it goes through. You could certainly put in uh, like a 3 uh, and see what you get. Like what, what does 3 give me? 3. I got 3 times 1 times 4, so 12. Okay, I'll just double check that. 3 times 1 times 4 is going to be 12. So my graph needs to adjust, right? I should have, I didn't plot that right. That should be 11, 12. Oh, it should go through like that. There, that's better, right? Except for, do all these parts of the graph go through the correct points? They can, and in fact, like the sloppy drawing I've made is two lines, and so it can't possibly go through all the right points. The only way to do that for, for sure is to plot all the points, which we don't have time to do. Um, that's what drawing a graph is all about. Like, let's get some points and know that it's pretty close. Right? If I put in any number between, um, between 0 and 2, between 0 and 2, I know I'm going to get a negative output. I'm going to get a negative output. So if I plug in anything in between here, in between 0 and 2, I'm going to get out negative outputs. Right? Well, I bet if I just barely go to the right of 0, I'm going to get a not very negative number. But if I keep going, I'll get more and more negative numbers, and they'll be the most negative number that I can get, and then it comes back up, right? You've got to get back up to 0 and then continue on here. Okay. So I'll bet this graph looks something like this, because I'm going to get these negative outputs. They're going to be more and more negative, and then they're going to come back up to the 0. Here, you can see, you could believe how this would just kind of be just barely positive. Any number between negative 1 and 0 that I plug in for x is going to give me a positive number. But they're, judging by the graph, probably not going to be very big. Uh, and then any number that's less than negative 1 is going to give me negative outputs. And so I put these negative ones. In. And then again, you might say, well, you don't know that it does that. And that's true. It is kind of a guess, but it is a good guess. Uh, it's a it's a correct guess that all these outputs will be negative. If I want to be, have a better guess, I could plug negative 2 in there, see what happens then. Negative 2, in fact, uh, I started to do that over here. Negative 2 times negative 4 times negative 1. Um, negative 2 times negative 4, 8. So um, negative 8. Negative 2, negative 8. So if I were to be really good about drawing my graph, I would make sure it goes through that point, and then the next point, the next point. But as we've discussed before, at some point, I just kind of have to draw my, my, my graph and hope that I hit all those points. Okay. Um, right, that's that first page. Now, the next page is going to look very similar, but watch how this function looks a little bit different from the next function. 
this function does not look like the other one. It's not written with those parentheses, right? And I, I mentioned that that was factored. So when I start with trying to find the x-intercepts and I say the output needs to be 0, how do I figure out what x values give me a 0 output? Well, I would need to write this in uh, that parentheses way, in that factored form, right? So there goes 0 equals, first I'll factor out an x, and I'll give me x squared plus 8x plus 15. And then I'll factor this quadratic. All right, this x can just kind of hang out here. You don't have to worry about it. You're just going to factor this part like this. Uh, I need two numbers that multiply to 15 and add to 8. You know, I know I'm going to get x times x is x squared. How about 3 and 5? Those multiply together to make 15 and add to make 8. Just to remind you why that's the case, why that's what we're looking for, we're just going to multiply these together. Right? x times x is x squared, x times 5 is 5x. We got 3x here, adds to 8x, and 3 times 5 is 15. But now we can see, as in the previous problem, uh, x would have to be 0, or x plus 3 would have to be 0, or x plus 5 would have to be 0. And so x is 0, or x is equal to negative 3, x is equal to negative 5. These are my x's that give me a 0 output, otherwise known on the graph as x-intercepts. Those are my x-intercepts. Okay, so that's done. Now, just taking some clues from our previous experience, um, in between any two x-intercepts, I must be like all positive or all negative. Like those outputs have to be all positive or all negative. Let's see what it would, if we believe that, say I could get a positive output here and a negative output here. I don't believe that, and here's why. Because to, to draw this graph, I would have to go up to this point and then down to this point and see I've already disproved that these points could exist that both of them could exist because this just went through the x-axis again. And there are no more x-intercepts. We found all three of them. There's not four of them. Okay, So the outputs in between any two x-intercepts would have to be either all positive or all negative. Uh, so we can kind of uh, make a little bit faster work out of these parts. I know the intervals. I know it's, uh, you know, x is, let's see, x is less than negative 5, or right here, x is uh, between, I guess I should have, x is going to be between negative 5 and negative 3, or x is going to be between negative 3 and 0, or x is going to be bigger than 0. Those are my intervals. What will I get out of each of those? I could just uh, test an x value. Just text, test an x value. Like, uh, I could test 1. I could plug 1 into the function. So let's get the function. Um, here's the function. y equals, or f of x equals, x times x plus 3 times x plus 5. Okay, so we've got that function. Let's try plugging in 1 in there. If I plug in 1, I'll get 1, 1, 1, right? Positive, positive, positive. Those are going to give me positive numbers. So any x that's bigger than, uh, oh, and yeah. So I plug in one. So any x that's bigger than zero, I can bet, will give me positive outputs. Positive outputs. Okay. Uh, now between negative three and zero, I'll just choose a x value in between those two numbers and try it out. Let's try negative one. Uh, I put negative one there, so that's a negative times it. Well, if I put negative one here or here, it's still going to be positive because taking away 1 from 3, still positive. Taking, one, taking away 1 from 5, still positive. Right? So I'm going to get a positive, a positive, a negative. So numbers between negative 3 and 0, they're going to result in a negative, right? Positive, positive, negative. OK, now let's look between negative 3 and negative 5. Let's try negative 4. I'll just go ahead and plug it in negative 4 times negative 4 plus 3 times negative 4 plus 5. Now look at that, negative 4 is negative enough to, when I subtract it from 3, be a negative number. So this is going to be a negative 4 times a negative 1 times a, now negative 4 is negative, but it's not negative enough to subtract enough uh, from 5 to go negative, right? So it's still going to be positive. So negative times negative is positive, that's a positive output. So my test was for between negative 3 and 5, right? So for x's that are between negative 3 
or I should put negative 5 and negative 3. Uh, that's going to give me positive outputs. And by the way this is switching, I'll bet that, yeah, I get these negative numbers, these negative outputs here. And uh, you just not very good looking graph. Uh, positive. Positive outputs, negative outputs, I'll bet I'll get negative outputs if I go less than negative 5. And that makes sense. Like if I choose negative 6, that's less than negative 5. Then negative 6, negative. Negative 6 plus 3, clearly negative. And now negative 6 is so negative. And when I subtract uh, 6 from 5, I get a negative number. So I get negative, negative, and negative. And so I get negative outputs. This is something like what my graph should look like. I don't know exactly what it should look like, but that's pretty close. The actual graph, it may look slightly different, but again, at some point you just have to say, I think this is pretty much what the graph looks like. I uh, can't say exactly unless I plot all the points. Yeah. Um, you could plug those numbers in and say, okay, like when there's, there's negative four, so negative 4 times uh, negative 4 plus 3 would be negative 1 times 1. And so I should get a positive 4. So I should have come up higher, right? If I want it to be more accurate. But then again, when I plug in negative 3 and a half, do I get exactly, I don't know, 3 or whatever that looks like that is? Maybe, maybe not. Let's get a small eraser and get rid of that. And then I could plug in negative 1 or negative 2 and see what what points I should go through there. But at some point you just draw the line, and for now, we're just sketching. Sketching is like a rough sketch. We're just drawing the line at finding the x-intercepts and making sure that we're negative when we should be negative and positive when we should be, should be positive. All right, so now that we see how that pertains to the graph, the inputs, the outputs of the function, um, to solve this equation, we would use a similar approach that we use to find x-intercepts, right? Set it equal to zero. The only difference is this is not from a function. This, this, was, this didn't start life as y equals x cubed minus 6x squared minus 72x. It's just an equation. It's, it's equal to 0. And when we solve it, we haven't found any x-intercepts. We've just found the solutions to this equation. Okay. Um, though if it had started life this way as a function, and then I chose to set it equal to 0 to find x-intercepts, then the numbers I'm about to find would be x-intercepts. But for now, since it didn't start as a function, just, it seems like maybe it's splitting hairs, uh, but it's not. It's very different. Um, the, the numbers that I get will be called solutions rather than x-intercepts. All right, so we'll factor out an x, just like we did in that, uh, the back side of that first page. Factor out an x, right? and that's going to give us x squared minus 6x minus 72. So we figure out what multiplies the negative 72 and adds to negative 6, negative 12, and positive 6. Those two numbers do that. And it's simple to see that if I plug in 0 for x, that will multiply everything by 0 and give us a 0. So there's one solution. If I plug in 12 for x, that will be 12 minus 12 is 0, making me multiply by 0 and giving me 0 as the, uh, as the result. And if I plug in negative 6, right? Or more importantly, I set up these equations. x equals 0, x minus 12 equals 0, and x plus 6 equals 0, and solve them all for x. Uh, we come over here and we factor out anything that we can that's in common, like a 9 and an m cubed. That leaves us with 6m squared plus 2m, uh, yes, plus 1 equals 0, which following our lead here means that 9m cubed has to be equal to 0. Divide by 9, take the cubed root, m would have to be 0. Or 6m squared plus 2m plus 1. So then we uh, try factor by grouping. We 6 times 1, that's 6. And we look for two numbers that multiply to 6 and add to 2. We won't find any. It's an unfactorable quadratic. Uh, so then we say, well, how do I solve quadratics that uh, I can't factor? Uh, probably the most common way would be the quadratic formula, right? So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, and that's negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus uh, 24 is negative 20. 
over 12. Okay. Um, clean this up a little bit. We'll get negative 2 plus or minus 2i root 5 over 12. And if you like, negative 1 plus or minus i root 5 over 6. Let's cancel the 2 that the numerator and denominator have in common. Um, and so what it has one real solution, 0, and two imaginary solutions, two complex solutions. Um, now if this were a function, Uh, and our finding is x-intercepts, what I would have found is it has one x-intercept at 0 and then no more real x-intercepts. So it might look something like this, right? So it goes up, it does all this curvy stuff, but only one part of it comes through the x-axis. Yeah, the x-axis. And all that curvy, curly stuff happens up in here, but never brings it back down and across the x-axis. Uh, all right, here we're going to factor by grouping. That's the key word there, grouping. Group groups of 2. Right? You remember doing this with quadratics that we multiplied the A and C together and so on, split it up. But we can do that here. And if you have four terms, then that's a good, uh, factor by grouping is a good instinct to follow. So what do these two have in common? They have a y squared in common. And what do these two have in common? They have a 4 in common. We get the two identical factors, which factor by grouping would not work without. Uh, like, imagine that these are in a parentheses, and we take the y minus 7 out of the parentheses. We factor it out. So we get y minus 7 out here, and left inside these parentheses, we would get y squared plus 4. Coming over here, factor by grouping. Uh, we got a 4c squared we can pull out, leaving with a c plus 2. Here we can pull out a negative 9, leaving us with c plus 2. If we distribute the negative 9, I get the negative 9c minus 18. And likewise, with the 4c squared, we get 4c cubed plus 8c squared. Okay, then we uh, can uh, factor out the c plus 2, and we get c plus 2 times 4c squared minus 9. And we have c plus 2. What I'm doing here is I'm noticing that this is a difference of squares, which we, uh, we've definitely spent some time with difference of squares. That would be, you could view this as uh, 4c squared minus, or I guess plus 0c minus 9. All right, and if you did factor by grouping on that guy, you would find you get 2c plus 3 times 2c plus, sorry, 2c minus 3. 2c plus 3, 2c minus 3. So we're going to factor this further as a difference of squares. All right. Moving on here. Um, so I say make x equal to, uh, to uh, k squared. So if x is equal to k squared, then what would k to the fourth be? Well, that's just the square of k squared, right? If I square k squared, I get k to the fourth. So that would be equal to x squared. So k to the fourth equals x squared. So I'll replace this k squared with x, this k to the fourth with x squared. Okay. As you work these more, you don't have to make the substitution. You could just notice this uh, without making the substitution. Um, but uh, it helps us to see that because this is twice as big as this power, um, there's these three terms. It's in quadratic form. So I can factor this just like a quadratic uh, that I would factor uh, if it looked like this. And we would have x plus 1 and x plus 6. But again, x is uh, actually k squared. We do need to, to put it back in terms of the, the factors uh, or the um, variables that we started with. So we'll replace x with k squared. k squared plus 1. k squared plus 6. And like I said, if you just notice, like, well, why would I replace it with x? It, it, I can see how k squared times k squared is k to the fourth. And if I do 6k squared and 1k squared, that's 7k squared. 1 times 6 is 6. Uh, good. If you can shortcut that, fine. Uh, or use a substitution to help you keep everything straight. Uh, we come over here. We have uh, 3k 
K. Uh, this is a mistake that I made, but hopefully I, I corrected all those papers and put a K there instead of an X. Uh, so uh, we'll pull out a 3K. We're left with 5K to the fourth minus um, 24K minus, um, this is three times, it's a 36. Right. Um, so this is like a quadratic. This should be a k uh, squared. Excuse me, twenty-four k squared. Um, so this is much like a quadratic, just like this was like a quadratic. You can make those substitutions, or I'll just go ahead and say I know this is going to be three k times two parentheses, where I have a k squared and a k squared. The only thing is, uh, this needs to be these two multiplied together need to be five k to the fourth. So treating this like a quadratic, I just use factor by grouping here. 5 times negative 36 is, let's go to calculator, 5 times 36. That's negative, though. So negative 180. Negative 180. Two numbers that multiply to negative 180 and add to negative 24. Um, Split up this negative 24 into the factors of negative 180. So I got 18 and 10. That's not going to work. Um, let's see, like maybe 30. I feel like 30 is going to work. Um, calculator 30. 30 times 6 is 180. So if I do minus 30k squared plus 6k squared. Um, and then I look at each of these as a group of two, factor by grouping. Uh, I still have the 3k out here, and I get, what are these having? I'm going to 5k squared. That leaves me with k squared minus 6. What are these having in common? A6 leaves me with a k squared minus 6, just like uh, we have here, right? So we have a k squared minus 6 times a 5k squared plus 6. And it's factored. And this isn't a difference of squares, so we're not going to factor it like we did this guy, which was a difference of squares. Okay. Um, so now, let me extend this down so you can see this stuff right here. Um, so I'm going to multiply this out. Let's see what happens. This is a very interesting pattern that uh, will have lots of cancellation, and we'll see an interesting result. So x times x squared is x to the third. Then we get plus 4x squared. Then we get plus 16x. Then we'll distribute the negative 4. Negative 4x squared. Look at that. Uh, negative 16x. Oh, look at that. And negative 4 times 60 is negative 64. So this cancels that, that cancels that. We're just left with two things, x cubed minus 64. OK, uh, let's look at it again. x squared times x to the fourth. We get x to the sixth minus 3x to the fourth plus 9x squared uh, plus 3x to the fourth minus 9x squared plus 27. Now look at that, negative x. Negative 9x squared, positive 9x squared. 3x to the fourth, negative 3x to the fourth. So we have x to the sixth plus 27. Um, so the, the terms in each of the results of 9 and 10, we have a cube, right? That's x cubed, x cubed, minus, and this is 4 cubed. And this is x squared cubed. That's a bit tricky plus 3 cubed. Okay, But they're both cubes. These are both cubes. These are both cubes. And just like we had a difference of squares here, there's also a pattern for a difference of cubes, and there's also a pattern for a sum of cubes, where there's no sum of squares pattern. Okay, And here's our sum of cubes pattern, and here's our difference of cubes pattern. I'm just going to go ahead and take a snapshot of that. I don't want to be flipping back and forth. So go to the next thing here, um, kind of continuation here. 
9 and 10, we see that the end results uh, are different uh, set of cubes. Um, they look like this. Uh, for number 9, what is A and B? And for number 10, what is A and B? So we just showed how A is x, because it's x cubed, and B is 4, because that's 4 cubed. Right? So it's x cubed minus 4 cubed. And in the second example, number 10, x squared was cubed, and then it was plus uh, 3 cubed, which came out to be 27. Okay. So if we view these like cubes, and now we'll bring in that thing that I, I copied. Where did it show up? There it is. Okay. If we use this pattern, these patterns, to factor our sum and difference of cubes, First, we have to notice what uh, A and B are. So in this case, A and B are x, obviously, plus 2 cubed. So just factor simply like this. If this is A and this is B, and is a sum, not a difference, I can use this pattern. x plus 2 times x squared minus 2 times x plus b squared. b is 2, so b squared is 4. And we're done. Over here, what's being cubed here? It's x cubed cubed. Right? 3 times 3 is 9. Minus 5 cubed. And now we have our a and our b, and it's a difference of cubes, so this is our pattern. So it's x cubed minus 5. Then x, squ x cubed squared is going to be x to the 6th plus b times a, or a times b, or whatever, so 5x squared, excuse me, cubed, plus 25, because that's 5b, right, 5 is b, and we square 5 and we get 25, all right? Just one more tool in the tool belt there. Solve the following using factoring techniques you've learned. So the sky's the limit, we can do whatever we want. So this one, it's, you know, if I'm going to use factoring techniques, equals zero is very important because I'm multiplying things together and getting zero, and so I know that one of those factors has to be zero. So I look here, and uh, I'm going to divide both sides by some number that's in common among all of these. So I'm thinking it's got to be four, right? So I get to, uh, I divide by four on both sides. I get four x cubed minus eleven x squared minus. Um, Oh shoot, 42 is not divisible by 4. That was a mistake. Uh, so we'll just do 2. Uh, that'll be 8x cubed minus 22x squared minus 21. And yeah, that's going to be it. Minus 21x equals 0. Um, now you should not divide by an x and try to cancel out an x because that's going to take away one of the solutions you should get. You should get another solution, and you'll lose it if you divide by x. So we'll just factor out an x, just like we've done before, right. times 8x squared minus 22x minus 21. And now we're going to use factoring by grouping. 8 times negative 21 uh, is negative, I don't know, I don't know that off the top of my head, 8 times 21, negative 168. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 168 and add to negative 22. So let's see. Um, 168 divided by uh, 20. That one's not going to work at all. Um, uh, 16. Let's try 16. Six, their difference is 22. So 28 and 6, I can write it as x times 8x squared minus 28x plus 6x minus 21. Uh, and so we 
factor by grouping. Grouping these two together, and these two together. X times, what do these have in common? A uh, 4, X, 4X. That leaves us 2X minus 7. And these have a 3 in common. 3 times 2X minus 7. We've got identical factors here, 2X minus 7. Of course we did. That's the only way factoring by grouping uh, has done what it was supposed to do. So we factor out 2X minus 7 times 4x plus 3, set it equal to 0, and now we have x must be 0, 2x minus 7 must be 0, 4x plus 3 must be 0. So we get the solutions, x equals 0, we solve this guy, subtract 3 divided by 4, we get x equals negative 3 fourths, uh, add 7 divided by 2, x equals 7 halves, okay? Alright, not an easy one, but Definitely not an impossible one. You just take it step by step by step by step. Right? We have factored out x's before. Uh, we have divided both sides by 4 before. We have factored by grouping before. We have set each factor equal to 0 and solved before. It just takes each little piece. Just do each little piece. All right. Now, equals to 0 is very important, as I said. So I'm going to subtract 60. n to the fourth minus 4. n squared minus 60 equals 0. Uh, I notice this is a quadratic form. It looks like a quadratic, only it was, it's n to the fourth and n squared instead of n squared and n, uh, n to the first. But I know it's going to factor as n squared and n squared. And I need two numbers to multiply to negative 60 and add to negative 4. Uh, 10, yeah, how about negative 10 and positive 6? So n squared minus 10 equals 0, n squared plus 6 equals 0, uh, n squared equals 10, n, n equals plus or minus the square root of 10, n squared equals negative 6, n equals plus or minus the square root of negative 6, n equals plus or minus uh, i root 6, i root 6. Last one over here. Equals to zero is very important when we're factoring, so we're going to add 48 to both sides. <clears throat> I have four terms here. Nothing to factor out that's in common. Like, we don't have a z in common or a 2 in common or something like that. Um, so if I have four terms, factoring by grouping, it's the grouping, right? Two groups of two. And you have four things to factor. You have four terms in your polynomial. So what does this group have in common? They have a z to the fourth. That leaves me with a z minus three. What do these two have in common? Since this guy's a negative right here, I like to factor out a negative, whatever it is. Negative four, leaving us with a z. Uh, no, it's uh, not four, it's, uh, 16. 16 can be factor out of both of these. Leaving us with a z minus three. 16 is 48. So we have z minus 3 times z to the fourth minus 16 equals 0. Uh, then I can factor this more is z minus 3 times z squared plus 4 and z squared minus 4 equals 0. So I get three equations z, z minus 3 equals 0. So z equals 3. Uh, z squared plus 4 equals 0. So z squared equals, ooh, I'm not showing you this. I apologize. Uh, z squared equals negative 4. So z equals plus or minus the square root of negative 4, which is 2i, right? A review of that. The square root of negative 4 is the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4. Square root of negative 1 is what we call i. And the square root of 4 is 2. 2 times i. So that's why that's plus or minus 2i. Then z squared minus 4 equals 0. z squared equals 4. z takes the square root of both sides equals plus or minus 4. And that is it. Okay. And, you know, that next one, I think we're going to just continue to work on that in class, this, uh, this sculpture one. Okay. But it does do try to step you through each little piece here, um, and this is this is pretty key. I'll just give you this here. 
the volume of a, a box shape, a box shape, um, is just the length times the width times the height, or length, width, height. And then it gives you some uh, relationships between the length and the width and the height, and you use those, and you can substitute them in for these quantities, and then you're going to get this polynomial, okay? So uh, give it a shot. Uh, try your best, and uh, we'll see where you get next class. Um, and I will see you then. Thanks so much for watching.